Well, I hope you enjoyed that music. And uh, we're going to move on now into our third area of God's purpose for Christmas, and that is reconciliation. Reconciliation is not an unfamiliar term. We generally use it to describe the coming together over differences. And though that's somewhat of a simplistic definition, that's exactly what God did for us. He came into our lives over differences. God is holy. He is pure. He is just. He is righteous. And as we learned last week, we are not. We are sinners. And there is a great gulf between us and God when it comes to that idea of purity and sinlessness. He was tempted, as we know, as all points like we are, and yet he was without sin. And so this idea of reconciliation really is all on God. He put aside our differences to come and have a relationship with us. He did that purposefully. Remember our verse, 1 John 4.10, God sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sin. Well, there's another verse, actually a passage, and it's a passage I want to look at today that I think relates to this subject of reconciliation very well. And it is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it begins in verse 16, and it goes to chapter 2, or chapter 6, verse 2. So I want to read that for you at this time. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, beginning at verse 16 and going into chapter 6 and verse 2. And we read like this. From now on... And that's a key phrase. From now on, it seems like simply three words, but it is significant. And I'll mention that again in a minute. But from now on, from this point forward, then we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, okay, since things are different now, therefore, here's something to do from this point forward. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled, there's our key word, reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, That is, in Christ, God was reconciling himself to the world. See, it was all of God. Not counting their trespasses, he didn't count our sins against us. And as he committed this, the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors. He has a job for us to do. For Christ, since God is making his appeal through us, We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. He took all that upon himself at the cross, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And working together with him, we also appeal to you, don't receive the grace in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Well, here's a few things I think we can learn from this passage about God's purpose in sending his son Jesus that Christmas morning to reconcile us to himself. Reconciliation. Here's letter A, if you have your outline. Reconciliation releases you from your sinful past. Amen? Reconciliation. It releases you from your sinful past. If you look at verses 16 and 17, and those phrases I mentioned to you appear there, from now on in verse 16, and therefore... And verse 17, from now on, points to the fact that as followers of Jesus Christ, you have a new perspective. From now on, you look at the world through the eyes of Jesus. 
From now on, you look at things through the lens of eternity. From now on, you realize that the life you live, you live by the grace of God who loved you and gave himself for you. From now on, your sins are forgiven. From now on, you have a home in eternity. From now on, things are different because you have a totally new perspective. Amen to that. And then you look at verse 17, where it says, therefore, well, since you have this new perspective, you're going to be a new person. Verse 17, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Well, last week we talked about sanctification and the setting apart by God and for God so that you can grow to be more and more like Jesus. This is also a part of God's reconciliation project that he has for you after you have experienced salvation. It's resolving the differences between a holy, perfect, and sinless God and a sinner. Now that these issues have been reconciled, you have a new beginning. You have a new creation. It's you. Once you experience salvation, he is at work in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, making you a new person. And so now you're a new person and you have a new perspective. You look at things differently because of who you are in Christ. Praise the Lord for that. You know, as I mentioned last week, God never saves us to leave us as we were. He always has a plan to make us become more and more like him. It's a new perspective. We see things differently, but we're also a new person. Reconciliation releases you from a past life of sin. And there should be evidence of that in your life, that becoming a new creation that we talked about last week. It doesn't happen automatically. You are saved instantly, but you're not mature instantly. It takes time. Like anyone who has a child and they watch them over the first year or two of their lives, and they're looking for certain developmental markers in that child. Do they begin to say words? Do they begin to crawl? Do they begin to walk? Do they begin to run? And uh, they get to that point and they become a little quicker maybe than you are. But if those developmental markers are not happening, you take your child in for a checkup because there's something wrong. There's something that is not maturing that should be. The same thing is true spiritually. If someone claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but yet they think and act the same way they did before they were saved, there's something wrong. They're lacking that new perspective. They haven't really become that new person. And maybe their faith is only a faith of words, not of the heart. And so we need to understand that if we are in Christ, we have that new perspective. We see things differently. We do that because we're a new person. New person in Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, and I'm reading verses 12 and 14 for you this morning. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. If you have a new perspective, you don't do this. Don't obey it in its desires. And do not offer any parts of your body to be used as sinful weapons. Use them for weapons against unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. I like that. You're a terminator, the terminator against unrighteousness, and you offer yourself as a weapon against unrighteousness and for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you. Why? You're a new person, and you have a new perspective. And why? You are under the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Well, reconciliation releases you from your sinful past. It gives you that new perspective. It makes you a new person. But it does something else. This is letter B in your outline. Reconciliation is a gift from God through our relationship 
with Jesus Christ. In verse 18, it says, Everything is from God who has reconciled himself through, reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We also, we've already mentioned, you're a new person, you have a new perspective, and now you have a new position. You are a reconciler. Now, most of you know that I have the gift of receiving, and we say that jokingly, but the fact is I love to receive presents, and I love it when my kids give me something. I love it when they give me something that I can use, and being around each other, they kind of see the things I like to do, and uh, they get these gift ideas. Oh, gee, I think Dad would really enjoy this. And I may have mentioned this to uh, some of you in passing a while back, but we like to go camping. And while we're camping, I like to get up in the morning and have my coffee and sit around the campsite, just get enjoying whatever's going on out there in nature. Well, a few years ago, uh, my kids got me a Coleman coffee maker. It's awesome. It fits perfectly on my Coleman camp stove. In fact, it's made for that. It's a match set. And uh, what you do is you fill up the reservoir with water. And I do this every night before I go to bed. And I put my filter in and I put the, uh, the whole thing on the stove in place. Put my coffee in and close it up. Put it on top of the stove so that all I have to do in the morning is come and light that burner under that coffee pot. I turn on the gas to my Coleman stove and I light that burner. And in a few minutes, that fragrance of a beautifully, uh, how do I want to say, dripped coffee, because that's what it is. It's a drip pot. It boils the water, works its way up through a little tube, comes down through the coffee and into the pot, and it is just wafting all around the campground. It just smells Beautiful as it's percolating there in the pot. I grab my cup and have my coffee and sit there and enjoy myself. It's beautiful. It's nice to have a gift that's useful. Well, you know, God has given us a gift. It's a gift of reconciliation. But it's not just a gift to hoard. It's a gift that we can use. I think it would be a shame if I never took that coffee pot out of the box. It works. People can say, oh, that's a great gift. What a wonderful, wonderful appliance that is. But the reality is, if it never came out of the box, it wouldn't be very useful, would it? You know, the same thing is true of the gifts that God gives us. And he's given us a gift of reconciliation. And it's a gift that we need to use. It's a gift that can overcome the sins of others by the grace of God, as it did in our own lives. And it's something that we need to pass on to others. And that brings us to letter C this morning. While well, reconciliation is a gift from God through our relationship with Jesus, but also letter C, reconciliation is the baton to us to pass on to others. In verses 20 and 21, it says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our job. It's what's been passed on to us. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. That's what we're to plead to others. To reconcile themselves to God. He made the one who did not sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's given us the gift of reconciliation, but he's also given it to us in the form of a baton, something to pass on to others. Now, when I was in high school, I ran track. <clears throat> One of the events that I ran was called the Mile Medley. I don't know if they do that anymore. They've taken all of the... Uh, American standard measurements and put them in the meters and so on. And uh, so I'm not sure what they call it today, but it was a mile medley back in my day. And what it was, was there were four guys on the team. 
The first two guys ran around half the track. It was 220 yards. And then the, uh, the guys that were after that, uh, the next guy, the third guy, ran one lap. So we have two guys running half a lap, and one guy running one lap, and then one guy running two laps. I was the guy that ran the two laps, the last guy. <coughs> Excuse me. And so between each of the runners, there was a baton, it was a wooden stick that was passed. It was critical that that baton be passed in stride. It was critical that it was passed succinctly between certain markers within the track. It was important that the runners kept looking forward when they were going. Otherwise, they might stumble or get off their uh, course and maybe get into another lane and run into a problem with another Another runner. It was important that it was done right. It was important that it was done correctly. It was important that it was done succinctly in order to keep things moving so that you didn't lose the race. If you dropped the baton, if you stumbled, even in the, if the handoff wasn't done well, you can lose a second and maybe that second would cost you the race. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? Well, same thing is true with the ministry of reconciliation. God has given up to us us as a gift, but he hasn't given it to us to hoard. He has, he's given it to us to pass on to others. He's given it to us because it's a useful gift, but he's given it to us so that we can give it to others so that the grace of God can enter into the lives of other people. And they can come to know Jesus too, and then they can pass that ministry of reconciliation, that baton, and to others as well. <coughs> Paul talks about this sentiment a little bit in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 6 and 8, where he says this, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I'm getting ready to fulfill my ministry. I'm getting ready to the end of my life. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've held on to the baton of the gospel, he says. I've been faithful at it. There's reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. Paul's saying, listen, it's important. I'm about ready to finish my race. God has something for me when I enter heaven. I don't know what it is, but he's going to give me something, a crown of righteousness. And he says, for you that are still behind me, this is my desire for you as well. And God has that for you. Paul talks about the race in a little different context in 1 Corinthians, where he says, don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Carry that baton with you. Like you're going to win the race. Don't give up. Keep going. Run the race. But when it's your time, pass it on to others. The ministry of reconciliation is an important, important ministry. We all know that we're sinners saved by grace. We all know that grace is all of God. The ministry of reconciliation, the coming together of differences, is God crossing the line to bring us into his presence. He didn't have to do it. God reconciled us to himself. Paul reminds us in Romans 5 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's him crossing the line in a sense. Coming over to our side to bring us into his side. He did that. That's what Christmas was. He was sending Jesus to earth, our side the sinful side, so he could come to the cradle. But the purpose was to go to the cross. Why? So that we could be reconciled. Those differences of our sinfulness could be brought in to his righteous presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? Be reconciled to God. Oh, we're going to close our time together 
Uh, we just want to remember that the reconciliation is a gift. It takes care of our past sins, but it also gives us the opportunity to pass it on to others. And we have a song that we're going to close with in just a minute after I pray. It's called Yes and Amen. And I hope that you will celebrate your reconciliation today as we close out with that song. Let's pray. Father, again, we are so thankful for Christmas. We understand it's more than just and more than about just the baby in a manger. We understand there's many, many broader uh, purposes that you have kind of entwined in that Christmas story. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful that you love us and that you're with us and that you're for us. We're thankful that our sins can be forgiven and we can escape the wrath to come and that we can become more and more like you every day. Thank you that we can have a new new perspective and be a new person and have new purpose in our life. So bless us today as we move forward by your grace. Help us to be the reconcilers that you intended us to be. And we'll thank you for that and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, God bless. <clears throat> I hope you can join us on our Google Meets in a few minutes. And in the meanwhile, I trust that you'll enjoy the music. Have a wonderful, blessed day.